All right, all you A-Push people. The next period in the Grand A-Push timeline is the Early Republic. This is basically the founding of the new government under the Constitution and everything involved with getting uh, the country up and running under the Constitution. So we're going to say 1789 is the start of this because that's the first Congress. Uh, of course, it's also the first president, but the Congress is the one that is passing the laws that is that are setting up um, all the things that are going to mark the new operation of the new government. We're going to say this uh, period ends in 1815 because that's the end of the War of 1812. The War of 1812 is marked by the Treaty of Ghent um, that is signed between the British and the Americans to end the war. So uh, we're also going to say it's going to end this period of the early republic. So um, what do you need to know about the early republic? First thing is that there's a sub-period in here that many historians call the Federalist Era. This is not just the beginning and the end of the Federalist Party. The Federalist Party will still survive for about another five years after this period is over. Um, but this is going to be the period of Federalist control. Uh, the Federalist presidents are George Washington and John Adams, and those two administrations put together mean they have full control of the U.S. government, and so it's called the Federalist Era. Um, what do you need to know from this mini-sub-period? Um, well, the first thing is actually already on the screen. That first Congress is one of the most important parts of the Federalist Era. When they come in and they set up the court system, when they come in and they pass the Bill of Rights, when they come in and they pass uh, Hamilton's economic plan and set up the national debt with the assumption of state debts, all that big stuff that was done by the very first Congress is probably the biggest positive thing about the Federalist era. It's not the only thing you need to know. Um, late in Washington's uh, second term, you're going to have the Whiskey Rebellion. You might remember this as the opposite of Shays' Rebellion meaning uh, the rebellions weren't opposite. They were fairly similar. They were Western farmers who were upset with actions of the government. But this particular time, it's literally the whiskey tax, so it's called the Whiskey Rebellion. What we mean by it's the opposite of Shays Rebellion is that Shays Rebellion basically shakes the government so hard that people think that the Confederation government might fall apart. Um, Washington learned that lesson, and so the national government under the Constitution responds with a much more firm hand and sends out federal troops. Uh, Washington even rides out with the troops for a good distance to show that he meant business, and so the Whiskey Rebellion shows that the new government under the Constitution means business and will enforce the laws that it passes, which is what kind of makes it the opposite of Shays Rebellion. Uh, Shays Rebellion almost brings the Confederation Congress to a close, whereas Washington shuts down the Whiskey Rebellion and says, yeah, this United States government don't play that way. Um, Washington then leaves office after two terms, and John Adams becomes the president. Um, during Adams' term is when this thing that Fraser called the quasi-war with France happens. Um, it's not really a sub-period here because it's never a declared war, but tensions were very high, ships were shooting at each other, so quasi-war is the term we give it. Because we were on a war footing with an enemy, that's when they passed the Alien and Sedition Acts. Um, the Alien Acts are directed essentially against French immigrants in America, um, I don't have any problem with directing things against French immigrants, um, but in this particular case, uh, they were worried that these folks would get to the point where they would be voting soon if they had been here long enough, so they were extending the amount of time that it took to become a voter because they knew that most voters were not going to be voting with the Federalists. And the far more serious part of this, of course, is the Sedition Act that says that saying things against the government, publishing things against the government, um, would be punishable by fines and going to jail. Um, you might say, but the first Congress passed the Bill of Rights, including the First Amendment that says we have the freedom of speech. Right, but the court case that brings in judicial review, the power of the Supreme Court to declare laws of Congress unconstitutional, hasn't happened yet. It's coming a little further in this timeline. Spoiler alert.
So anyway, um, this law is allowed to stand. Jefferson and Madison write the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions in protest against it, but it's just a protest. And so if John Adams is usually remembered for any particular thing as president, it's these alien and sedition acts. And so um, that's going to be one of the big things that is going to have Jefferson and Madison split off um, and, and start their own party that's going to come to be called the Republicans or the Democratic Republicans. And in the election of 1800, Jefferson will win. And that's a much bigger deal than it might sound. Um, the election of 1800 is sometimes said to be super important, not just in U.S. history, but in world history, because it's pretty hard to find instances before this time of any opposition group having a peaceful transfer of power. Um, people would often pass down the power to people that they had handpicked, but usually opposers getting it was through something like revolution, something like a coup, something usually involving some kind of violence. So a peaceful transfer of power from John Adams to his main enemy, well, that's quite a big deal. And as a matter of fact, this election of 1800 is one of only three elections that the College Board says you need to know. Uh, the other two are 1860 and 1980, but we'll get to those when it's their turn in the Grand A push timeline. So now that Jefferson is president uh, of the United States, his big claim to fame as president is, of course, going to be the Louisiana Purchase. In 1803, because of an offer from Napoleon, uh, he's basically going to double the size of the United States, um, getting us land west of the Mississippi River. That's going to be explored by Lewis and Clark and is going to be the basis for westward expansion and all the rest. It's a big deal. Uh, in the same year, though, we also have the court case of Marbury versus Madison. This is what I was just referring to uh, about a minute ago with the case that establishes judicial review that says that when things are unconstitutional, it's the Supreme Court that's going to get to decide. That is a huge precedent in U.S. history, and it comes during this period. So Jefferson will also serve two terms and then step aside. James Madison becomes the new president. And the biggest thing that happens while James Madison is president is the War of 1812 that is going to end this period. Um, there had been a lot of tension between the United States with both Britain and France. That's what gave us the Embargo Act under Jefferson. It's what gives us the funnily named Non-Intercourse Act under Madison and the weirdly named Macon's Bill No. 2 that basically leaves us having Britain as the big people that we're mad at. We kind of patch it up with France and the attention focuses on Britain. And so uh, the United States and Britain are going to go to war against each other in 1812. There's going to be naval battles. There's going to be British troops on American soil. There's going to be the, their taking of Washington, D.C. and the burning of the Capitol and the White House. And it is James Madison, who is the president, who has to get the heck out of Dodge because the British have shown up. And uh, you can still go to a place in Washington, D.C. today called the Octagon, where Madison basically had to go because the White House had been taken by British troops. So once this war comes to a conclusion, um, it kind of leaves people relieved, but it doesn't leave a clear victor. Um, what is sometimes called the Second War of Independence, this War of 1812, I think that's kind of a pretentious name for it, but you should know that some historians call it that. Um, it basically ends with no clear winner, and so things just kind of go back to a time of peace. And uh, that is almost the end of James Madison's administration, and so we're going to call it the end of the early republic.